Well, welcome back for a very special episode of Tech Whispers. And very special, you're gonna notice it's a tad longer and you're gonna see why here shortly. Uh, you know, we bring the best and the brightest audience together in this episode, in this podcast. And, you know, that's a lot of pressure, but today we overachieve with our guests and you're gonna see why with my three special people here in just a minute. We're gonna to talk today about the journey to the board, the CIO's journey to the board in particular. And we're gonna do that through the stories of Julie Colvin, who many of you know for her, her C plus roles at Forescout and FireEye, and also her leadership journey and roles at tech companies like Autodesk, McAfee, and Oracle. And Julie, very vivid for me. I remember the first time we met, we were on a panel together. You remember? Uh, I do, I do. Bay Area CIO. And uh, you smoked the room. I mean, it was like, it was so fun, like just to carry your water and, and make copies and make your coffee and just, you were amazing. So tell us about the boards that you're on today, Julie. Yeah, um, so I'm on six boards uh, right now. I'm on um, one public company board, Axon, and then I'm on five private company boards in a variety of technology spaces. So one is Heartflow, another is Cobalt, um, OpSWAT, SADA and Adea. So um, three of them are more security focused um, and then the others are medical technology or um, more of a, a Google cloud play that's very interesting. So, um, and they're all different and fun. Amazing, we're gonna unpack that and in, uh, in your spare time, six boards in your spare time, right? It's, uh, it's yeah. a lot going on. Yeah, going and, on. and I don't, when I met you, you also introduced me to Bev K. So I'm forever grateful for that because I was a total fangirl and never thought I would ever get the opportunity to meet her, let alone be on a panel with her. So thank you. Yeah, that was awesome. Uh, Bev K, obviously the author of Love Them or Lose Them, uh, basically the book on retention, right? Which is kind of timely today. Yeah. Uh, good stuff. Our second guest today, welcome Carol Zierhofer, known for her incredible work at Bechtel at ITT where she was really instrumental in helping that company break into three different companies, which was incredible. Uh, number of roles at Northrop Grumman. On a personal note, we're both graduates of the same business school at the University of New Hampshire. And Carol, mm -hmm. I will never tell, nor will you, which one of us graduated first, because that would imply <laughs> something. Secret, secrets. <laughs> and, uh, you know, Carol, you and I get to know each other really well because uh, Brian, Watson and I wrote the book, Confessions of a Successful CIO, and we featured at the time the best CIOs out there. And, and we were so appreciative when you said yes and came and shared your story. And I remember when you showed up, I learned a lot about executive presence and executive preparation, mm -hmm. um, the way you came to that, that, that interview. But tell us about your board roles, Carol. Sure. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm currently on the board of two publicly traded companies. Um, one is called All Scripts, and uh, actually just a a couple of days ago, we sold a major portion of the electronic health records um, to a private company in Canada, um, but we're still in the, um, in the medical IT space. I'm also on the board of a company called Atlas Air Worldwide. So it's the largest air cargo um, company in the world. So if you're buying something on, on Prime or on and gets from FedEx, chances are it's on an Atlas Air um, airplane. Um, I'm on the, on the board of a nonprofit, which um, is something I had started with my sister, and we serve um, kids with autism and provide them with job opportunities through a coffee shop and social activities and, and things like that. And then I'm on the board of two um, startups, one in, uh, in the Boston area and one out in the Valley uh, called Ops Cruise, and the other one's called Allium. And um, that's just an interesting twist on, um, on, on board roles. So yeah. keeping me busy. Incredible work. No, great stuff, Carol. I want to unpack all that here soon. And Wayne Schertz, our third, our third guest today. Uh, Wayne's known for his great work as CIO and CTO at a number of companies, uh, Cisco Foods, Super Value, Cadbury Shreps, as well as uh, Nabisco. And uh, he too has New Hampshire connections with a, a, a smaller, lesser known school called Dartmouth up here in New Hampshire. <laughs> so uh and, and Wayne, uh, similar to Carol, you and I got to know each other really well at the same time when we were writing the book, the Confessions book. And it, 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 I'll never forget, Wayne, we, we dig in. These are long interviews. They're pretty detailed. You started off 
with a story about failure. I don't know if you remember it, but it really impacted Brian and I. And it was one of those stories in your, early in your career, you thought it was over, you thought you were done for, and obviously went on to do amazing things. But uh, welcome, Wayne. Tell us about your, the board you're on. Hey, great to be here, Dan, and great to be here with Carol and Julie. Um, currently, I serve on one public company board, which is Armstrong World Industries. You'd know that as Armstrong the Ceilings Company. Um, I will have been on that three years come July. Uh, I was recently made um, uh, chairman of the compensation committee, and I only mention that because it's nice for a technology person uh, who comes on the board in that role to get a committee chairmanship. So I wanted to encourage folks with that. And um, I serve on the um, advisory board of two third generation family businesses. They both happen to be third generation family businesses. I say advisory board because the family actually serves as the fiduciary board, but we we kind of the advisory boards kind of advises them on things that a normal public board company would do. And that's um, Milton's Distributing and Gordon Logistics, which third generation family business. Um, they are a alcohol importer and distributor. Um, their main business is not all of it, but their main business is they import and distribute um, the private label wines for Trader Joe's, Whole Foods, Wegmans. Um, and then I'm on the, since January, I'm on the, the board of Jake's Finer Foods, which is a uh, food service distributor, um, mainly in the Houston area, but kind of brings me back to my, to my roots in Cisco, their third generation family and their 76th year, I believe. So, um, very fun business to be involved with. Well, I hope some of your compensations in good wine. <laughs> <laughs> We'll, we'll yeah, work you for can't wine, beat that. Right? We'll work for wine. We'll work for wine, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's interesting, Wayne, you mentioned the, uh, you know, the, the, the journey of our profession, right, to, you know, some will say from the boiler room to the boardroom and, and now on, you know, leading the committee. And so, you know, we're still kind of the new kid on the block, right? We all know that. And uh, good friend, Will Markow, who's uh, executive at MZ Burning Glass, probably the best labor market analytics company in the, in the world. Um, he shared some of their data with me recently that there's 8,320, 8,320 current CEOs and board members who have experienced as a CIO or CTO, right? So that, just hold that data point for a minute. So I'm just curious if that number surprised you, you know, what that trend means to you. And uh, Julie, as you, as you hear that number the first time, so I probably don't have enough context to know what the possibilities would be, but I would say it probably still seems low to me, right? Considering, you know, boards, you know, each are different sizes, but when you think about the boardroom, you know, often 10 people sitting around a table, right? It, it feels like there's still huge opportunity to get more digital security technology skills into the boardroom. Yeah, and into CEO roles, right? I mean, that that's that's another key area where I think we've seen some successes, but there's probably an opportunity for much more. Yeah, no, right on. And you know, Carol, there's other data that that shows uh, there's metrics around digitally savvy boards significantly, not kind of sort of, but significantly outperform those that are not. So when you yeah. look at revenue growth, market cap growth, all those key measures, um, makes you wonder why more boards don't have more digital muscle like the three of you. Yeah, you know, I think we are seeing that as a trend though. They are adding adding digital muscle. Um, I forget the exact number. I think it's somewhere between eight and 12% of boards actually have a tech committee or they had one and perhaps it's been disbanded, which don't think of that as a bad thing. Then they've actually just transitioned that to a full board responsibility. Um, I think that digital savvy will continue to be one of the capabilities um, that boards are looking for. And for those who don't know that, that's exactly what boards do. They put together a competency matrix and they say, what do we need for the competencies of our board? And it's often, you're gonna see digital, you're gonna see more data. So you know, underneath digital is data and who's winning the world, who's winning now in data is, is who's gonna win in, in the marketplace. So that, digital data, cyber transformation, change management, those are all competencies that um, boards are looking for. And I think one of the, the keys there of continuing to have a digital savvy presence on the board is having people that aren't just a one trip pony. You know, they're, they're not gonna take a seat just because you've been a CIO, just IT. You have to have multiple competencies because there are only so many seats. So that domain knowledge, 
of, of where your, um, your company is at, combined with the digital, the transformation, the cyber, all those things I mentioned, I think we'll continue to see digital savvy boards growing and can it's data, data, data. How can you weaponize and use your data to um, help your customers and serve your customers? Fascinating, you know, and, and Wayne, we all know the stereotypes of our profession, right? Uh, the, the, the introverted IT person looks at their shoes when they talk to you and the extroverted looks at your shoes when they talk to you. So <laughs> we start there, but you know, when did this pivot happen? You've been in this business for a while, right? I mean, why, when, you know, can you put your fingers on, on, on when that took place? I think it was a journey. So I think back to, to Y2K when suddenly technology was important. Um, but we were important in that we didn't want to blow up the business in Y2K. So we really, I, I think we were still very much a back office function there. And then the dot com came and, and we started to get a little bit out of the back office. E-commerce came and, and we were now becoming a revenue, a revenue stream. And then, you know, as we went further down the road, new business models came using technology. You think of Airbnb, you think of uh, Uber, uh, companies that were technology startups that completely revolutionized an industry. And I think that's really when, when and cyber has been there all along, um, but I think that's growing in its risk and its importance. But I think this new business models companies realizing that technology can provide whole new opportunities, new ways of doing business and potentially new disruptions um, from competitors that you never even saw coming is, is what really um, got boards interested in having uh, um, people with the tech. I think Carol said it really well. They're looking, they are looking for well-rounded business people first. Mm -hmm. And second, somebody who really understands technology and can and can help weigh in on cyber, on new business models. Um, but I think going back the last 20 years, Dan, I think that that's that's when it happened. Yeah, really good. And I think that's a good lead into uh, the origin story. That's always it's always uh, fascinating to hear the origin stories, how you got to the board. And you just mentioned, Wayne, it's not a, a tech savvy CIO, right? It's a business savvy CIO. And so Carol, I'd love to hear your, your board origin story. Yeah, you know, um, I was I was working at ITT at the time as the CIO. And interestingly, when I took the job, um, they told me I was going to report to the CFO. And before I even joined, I got a call and said, well, we changed that. You're going to report to the CEO. And they had a very tech savvy board member who said, oh, no, 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 that's not where we're, we're going to put her. You're going you're to do this instead. But anyway, um, the CEO is, was an amazing leader. His name was Steve Warringer. And Steve really encouraged all of his executives, his top leadership team, to go and get a board seat. And I was kind of surprised by that because, you know, some CEOs say it's a distraction. They'll say, no, we want 100% of your time here. You know, we're not going to let you take the time off, whatever. And he really felt it made you a better executive. So um, I, I took that seriously. And he was obviously the CEO at ITT. He was on the board of FedEx. Um, I had just finished a relationship getting placed at ITT with, a, um, with an executive search firm. So I contacted them and I say, anybody who wants to land a board seat, you gotta have great relationships with the executive search firms because many of them are aware, you know, are, are, are the ones who are placing board members. So I just let them know that I was interested. And lo and behold, a year later, um, I had um, left ITT when we split the company into three. I was um, the CIO at Xerox at the time and a fairly small but publicly traded company. They did about a billion dollars in, in revenue, maybe 800,000 at the time, was looking for a tech savvy, cyber savvy person to come and join the board. Why? Because they really realized everything they did underneath was IT and they had no IT tech representation on the board. Really great group of people. They were in the um, medical um, services space and group purchasing. So I had a you know, very strong purchasing background, had the IT background and um, ended up, yeah, landing the job. And one of the things that they were recruiting for was to stand up a tech committee. So I was the founding chair and created the tech committee and I'll just tell a real quick story because what was so interesting about this as an origin story was a company knew they needed IT experience in the boardroom. They didn't have that. They knew they needed cyber. They knew they needed transformation. When I stood up the tech committee and we began to have conversations around the strategy 
and the profitability of each of their products and services. I'm reporting out to the board, just like the audit committee is, the comp committee is, my little 10 minutes. And the other board members are going, really? You're talking about that? Can I, can I join your committee? Because what were we doing? We were talking about the strategy of the company, and, but, and they weren't doing that in the boardroom as they should have. We started it there, and then we migrated a lot of those conversations to the full board. We still had the tech committee when we sold the company to private equity, but it just changed the conversation. Um, and it was just a really great start to you know my board role. So I started, that was called Met Assets. Met Assets, we sold to private equity. 80% um, of it got spun off to um, a privately held company. And they asked two of us who were on the board to join them. So I literally transitioned from one board through the acquisition to, um, to the other. And um, just kind of let that sit because working full time and one board for me was enough. I didn't really believe that a second was um, a responsible thing to do. Um, but then when I retired from a uh, full-time CIO land, the, uh, the recruiters came and knocked again and, and I was fortunate to land a couple other positions and I just, just love it. It's a different way to contribute. So that's my story. I love it. I know, I know that you're all enjoying this this uh, part of the career very much. Uh, you've all retired from the day-to-day sea -day level uh, craziness. And I think if I add it up right, at least 12 boards now. So uh, between the three of you, uh, Wayne, what's your, your origin, board origin story? Well, I was, I was sitting CIO at, uh, at Cisco, S-Y-S-C-O, Cisco, the food company. Um, I like to say it's a much less technical, but much better tasting Cisco. <laughs> <laughs> um, when it was in 2015, um, and to Carol's point, Corn Ferry came knocking. Um, back when I had when I had landed at Cisco in late 2012, um, I was kind of in the market, and Corn Ferry was one of the companies I was dealing with, and because they they remembered me or whatever. But Conway, the trucking company, the freight and trucking company, was looking for a business savvy um, member who really knew technology. Um, technology was kind of back in 2015, even beginning to um, show its show its way in strategy in the trucking industry um, in, in a number of different ways, whether it be around routing or safety or um, fuel economy. There's, there's a customer experience, a huge one. Um, so they were looking for a technology leader there who really knew business and could be a full fledged contributing board member. Um, and, you know, early in my career, you mentioned Nabisco before, Dan, I started as a, a finance guy and actually spent some time in sales, which is a story for another day, uh, supply chain, marketing, um, logistics, uh, shared services. So I had a pretty broad cross-functional background to go along with the technology um, and got interviewed for the job by Corn Ferry. They sent me along to Conway. Um, was fortunate enough to get offered that board role, uh, sat on the audit committee and the uh, nominating and governance committee. Um, it was, it, I went through, um, Carol mentioned it, it, it took a while um, to get my company to say, yes, they wanted me to be on a board. Our chairman, who was a chairwoman, Julie, um, uh, Jackie Ward, uh, was very, very supportive. She felt like uh, being on a board would just, for everybody, give them different experiences and make them better executives. And I found that to absolutely be the truth. Um, my CEO was a little more concerned about my workload, um, but, but, then, but then agreed. And so I got on the Conway board. Um, I was on uh, for, for 10 months before we were, I was probably on for six months before we got an offer uh, to buy us from XPO Logistics. Um, so I was on that board for 10 months before um, Conway just became a part of XPO Logistics. And unlike Carol's company, they didn't ask any of the Conway people to join the XPO board. So, uh, so that was the end of that one. But it was, it was great. It was a great experience. Yeah, these are amazing stories. And Julie, I want to hear yours too. And I'm curious, wh where did you start your career, Julie? What was your first your I first also job? I also started in finance. I thought I was going to be a career corporate finance. Yeah. And, and, you know, I will say that my first CIO role at FireEye was the first time I had ever worked in the IT function, right? I have always been on the, you know, kind of quote unquote business side. I, I spent a lot of time in go to market 
um, and then did a lot of operational roles. And, you know, when I had this unique opportunity to, to take on my first CIO role, I remember asking, you know, the CEO that was going to bring me on, saying, why me, right? Like, if you look at my background and, you know, for him, it was like the fact that you haven't worked on IT, I see as a bonus, right? Because you're going to bring the, the business perspective. You've done a lot of the roles and, and you'll, you'll be, you know, partnering with, with folks that do the jobs you used to do. So, and, you know, also there was a get shit done kind of component to it as well. He's like, I know you'll get it done. So, um, and for me, my board journey, uh, you know, it, I was, uh, like I said, first time CEO at the time, and um, I had connected with a group of technology leaders, women leaders in the Bay Area. And one of those um, women, Coco Brown, had decided that her mm -hmm. next uh, phase of her career was going to be helping, um, you know, get better board diversity. Um, and so she started what was a nonprofit at the time that has pivoted to a for-profit, something called Athena Alliance. And the whole goal there is to bring really strong, diverse, um, ready candidates to boards, whether they're private, public, nonprofit, et cetera, and really help with that challenge. And I was an early member of that and went through the whole process of really understanding what is my board superpower, why would somebody want me on their board, um, and kind of going through that painful process of really talking yourself up and saying why you're such a, a great business leader, et cetera, and kind of what your superpowers are. And at the same time, they partnered with companies that were looking to bring diversity into their board. So I interviewed for my board position at Axon. It was my very first board position I ever interviewed for. It was a public company board. They were looking for broad technology and security capabilities, but they were also looking for diversity. And I had some really stiff competition from other Athena Alliance members, as well as amazing women technologists out there. And I really thought it was going to be a practice run, like, hey, this is going to be great experience because it's never going to happen. And sure enough, almost five years later, I'm a member of Axon's um, board. And I, too, started on audit with a subcommittee around technology and security. Um, mm -hmm. That has evolved into I now chair the Enterprise Risk Committee, where we have brought technology and cyber into that focus because it is so critical to the business. Um, and yeah, it's been an amazing experience. And I think what got me to the table was my technology background. But what I think really helped me get the position was the fact I had done go to market, I had done operations, I had done a variety of things, and I could really play, you know, across a lot of different areas. Um, and so I really do encourage, you know, I did not think I was ready. I thought this was going to be like, hey, you say you want to be on a board and years later, maybe it happens. Um, it's never too early to start. Yeah. So not only have you broken the stereotype of, of the CIO, CTO, but you've also broken the stereotypes of finance bean counter types, right? I mean, yeah. this is, we're, we're making some big, big ground today. Yeah. Um, you know, I think, two, yeah. Julie mentioned something really important, and that is, you know, knowing that superpower, what, what is it that you're going to bring and being able to art, articulate that and really make a connection? And, you know, so much of the being successful in the boardroom is the dynamics. And I think they really are looking for a leader who's going to play well in, in the room. And um, I'm just gonna, and you guys chime in, I, you know, part, go back to my origin story. I'm there, I was like, Julie, I'm interviewing the CEO saying, this is such a long shot. Oh my gosh, <laughs> you know, whatever happens, I'm gonna be okay with it. And we ended up making this connection because we both at the time were supporting a nonprofit which was supporting the Lost Boys of Sudan. Such as, I mean, a small, some people don't even know the Lost Boys of Sudan are, but, but it's like, wow. And we just, you know, then had this conversation about our values and different things that we were doing outside of, um, of you know, our work world. And it's like, that dynamic makes a big difference. So it's, um, it's kind of interesting. I'd love to just add a little to that. Um, so, I would say when I talk to prospective board, you know, candidates and when they'll ask me, hey, you know, advice or whatever, you know, one of the things I noticed between interviewing for an operational role versus the board role is to your point, Carol, it is so much about that connection, the, hey, are we going to be able to, to work together to debate all that kind of stuff? And it is all these other things that I think come into play that often wouldn't come out in more of an operational interview. So I think that's an important piece. And I will also say that 
I've interviewed for a lot of boards. I didn't get the board position. And I have no doubt that it wasn't, hey, look, she's got the right background, but, but there was something maybe missing with, with the connection side of it. And so I do tell people like, look, when you don't get these, don't think about it as, hey, you're not qualified for it. Because I think there's a lot of other dynamics at play that, that are just, you, there's not much control you have over them per se, right? Yeah. Um, but it's it's interesting because it is very different than when you're going for those operational positions, I think. Right, right. And that can be a mistake that people make in the interview process of being so operational down yeah. and in, they're really looking for something you yeah. know, a little bigger of who you are and yes. how you're going to, you know, present yourself and how you're going to have a, a debate, but, you know, be okay with having yeah. a respectful debate. So, yeah. I agree. I agree. Sorry, Dan. I just want to add one other thing on the, on the, what both Carol and Julie talked about, the ability to kind of articulate your superpower and why you should be on a board. One of the boards that I'm on now had me in for an interview um, and they, they knew they were targeting a technology person. But quite honestly, I could tell you, I was in a group board interview. I could tell you that several of those members knew they were targeting a technology person, but I'm not sure they knew why. <laughs> and I kind of spotted that. And then I gave them the why. And mm -hmm. I, I spent a lot of time telling them why they'd want a technology person on their board and what they could do. And it was about new business models. It was about disruption. It was about the things technology could do. And that was kind of the connection moment. So um, really good points. Yeah. Yeah, the why. Back to the why. You were demonstrating your superpower right there. Yeah. yeah. Connection, you know. So speaking of superpowers, uh, Carol, is, you know, we're going to go inside the boardroom now. And you're the one who first taught me about the whole concept of nose in, fingers out. Ah, yeah. You know? <laughs> and I, I've got to believe that's really hard to do when you're operating as a C-level executive and then also as a board member to straddle those two lines. So just describe what that is and how you manage yeah. that. Yeah. So nose in, fingers out is just a reminder or a lesson for board members that it's not the board's job to run the company. That's management's job. You know, the board's job is, is different. It's oversight. It's making sure the strategy is in place. It's hiring and firing and rewarding the CEO and their, their top leadership. It's setting a tone for, you know, integrity, all those things. You know, your duty, though, your service is to the shareholders. So the, the whole nose in, fingers out is get that nose in there, look around, know what's happening, you know, there's a, a level of detail you certainly need to be at to be to bring value. But the fingers out part is that you're not managing the company that is not that is not your job. Now, as a tech leader, I in the interview process actually have always brought this up. It's kind of want to make sure they're okay with it. I want to go meet with your CIO for a day, day and a half. I want to go meet with your CISO. I want to understand what your tech strategy is, what your risks, you know, how you're managing risk in that space. And I want to understand how you're enabling the business. And um, if they're not comfortable with that, then, they, then I'm not the right person for them. But the, you're still fingers out. But the nose in part for me is I want to have a relationship with those people before something bad happens, because when something bad happens or goes wrong, it's too late to build the relationship. So I love having a relationship with the company and with management that they will call me up and say, hey, you know, we're struggling with this. What do you think? Do you know somebody that we can talk to? Um, but it's not my job to run the company. It's their job to run the company. And it's the board's job to provide that, that oversight, knowledge, experience, wisdom, um, but knowing that we represent shareholders every day of the week. Yeah. Yeah. What a gift for those C-levels to have someone like you on the board and you know, Julie, you were actually wearing two C-level hats, chief technology, chief people officer at the mm. same time and also on the board. So how did you manage that? Um, you know, look, I, I will say the whole nose and um, fingers out initially, uh, I, I heard a lot of people saying how very hard it would be for me to play that role, right? Because I am like jump in, problem solve, let's fix this, let's go do. And I will say it was far easier than, than um, uh, people make it out to be. Um, it's actually quite refreshing, right? To be able to play more of this consultative advisory coaching kind of role and then not actually be responsible for having to go do some of the execution around that. But to Carol's point, um, 
I think I have brought great value to the boards that I sit on because of my willingness to engage at whatever level they want me to gauge in terms of, you know, mm -hmm. thoughts, opinions. Hey, what did you do? Do you know somebody? All that kind of stuff. And, you know, I mean, I think of some of the transformational projects, some of the companies that I've been on the boards of are doing and to have somebody that had been through some of those transformational business model uh, projects and programs and all that kind of stuff. Um, I think I can engage at a level and they want me to engage. So I kind of follow their lead a bit in the sense of, hey, I'm willing to help as much as I can, but I'm also not forcing myself or inserting myself, I think, in places where it's maybe not wanted. Um, but that's what I love most about it is, is really being able to, to, you know, sort of share some of the scars <laughs> and some of the lessons learned, or more importantly, connect people and say, Hey, look, I know somebody that's doing the exact same thing. Let me just connect you. And you guys can do some benchmarking and those types of things. So it's really, it, it's really a rewarding perspective and, and role to be in. I think. That's yeah. powerful. Yeah. Yeah. Wait, what's your, what's your experience? I mean, take us in that first board meeting. Right. What's that? What's that like? I mean, how do you show up different? Right. Do you jump in and just start going to town? Do you kind of listen for a while? What's what was your strategy? Uh, I think I'm not sure I had a strategy going in. I think I got smarter as I went through it. But um, but the strategy, you know, I the advice I would give is is dig in and contribute right away where, you know, you have something valuable to add. Um, if you're still, as I went to Conway, there was a lot of things about the freight business and other things that I was still learning and, and, and still needed to learn. Um, it's not that my opinions at that point in time would have been really valuable. So I probably kept my mouth shut more on those issues as I learned, as I learned some, but certainly on, on technology related issues or issues beyond that, where I, m &A, where I felt I could really contribute it, I did. And I got a lot of coaching um, early on from the Conway board saying, hey, we're not like one of these companies where if you're a new board member, you can't really say anything for a year. We want you to jump in and contribute right away. Um, you know, I've been on four boards now and I, I don't know any of them who want you to be quiet for a year. I think they want you to jump in and contribute where you can right away. Um, but it was it was it was not a hard adjustment, but it was an adjustment going from operating and running something and wanting to dig in and create you know the plan and execute it. There was an adjustment in doing that. You know, we're talking about the nose in hands out. I have an analogy to that that I tell people when they ask me what it's like being on a board, and I say, well, do you ever talk to a, a, a fairly new grandparent? And you ask them, how's it going? And they say, oh, it's great. I love it. Well, what do you love about it? Well, I get to play with a kid all day long. And then at the end of the day, I give them back. And that's, <laughs> that's sort of what being on the board is like. You get, to, you get to be involved in big strategic conversations, really important conversations um, uh, that can shape where the company is going and what they're doing. But at the end of the day, you give it back to management to go execute on that. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's important to let them do their job as they do that. Yeah, love the grandparent analogy. That's powerful right there. Uh, <laughs> I get it. So the three of you are also uh, advisors on the advisory board for the Tech Whispers podcast. And I thank you for that and steering us in really great directions. And as you know, one of the special features of the show is we like to bring in a question from the audience that you don't know who it is. Uh -oh. right? I went out and found somebody who actually knows and loves and respects the three of you immensely. And so she has amazing questions. And so uh, let's play it right now. And uh, Wayne, I'm going to have you take the first part of the. Of course, this person asked really smart, multi-pronged questions. <laughs> so I'm going to have you answer the first one. So let's listen in. And then tell us who this is, Wayne, and then answer the first question, if you would. Let's, let's, let's listen. What is the best argument for full-time CIOs and digital leaders to not wait for retirement before they pursue a board director position? Oh, we know that voice. Why would their CEOs encourage senior leaders to take on external board positions? What's in it for the company? Awesome. Who's that, Wayne? Um, That's um, Mary Fran Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, Mary Fran was the was the editor of CIO magazine for years, and I think now she has her own kind of information media business and po podcast. Great to hear her voice. Yeah. 
I was in your office one time, Wayne, we were meeting and uh, Mary Fran called in and you're like, you looked at your cell phone, so you, you're like, it's Mary Fran. You don't have to even get her last name. It's Mary <laughs> Fran. Let me pick this up. So that's a great story for us. But yeah, take, take her first question if you would. Yeah, so that was about um, uh, why should CIOs and digital leaders not wait for their first board role and get involved? Um, listen, the advice that I was getting from the chairwoman at, at Cisco when, when I was in the hunt for the uh, uh, Conway uh, board role was it's going to make you a better executive. You're going to go out, you're going to get, you know this company well, you know the companies that you've worked with well, you know this board well, but you're going to see a lot of smart people on the, at the new company that you're at in management and on the board with similar or different problems that, that have different ways and different processes and different thinking for how to solve those problems. And that exposure and working through those issues with them and seeing that work is just going to make you an all around better thinker and better executive. And um, I think that's, um, that's the best advice that I could, that I could give to folks as to why you don't want to wait. I'll say one other thing about CIOs and it, um, I think, in, in a lot of ways, sitting CIOs have an advantage over a retired person like myself to get on a board. And that advantage is um, we all know technology changes at a very rapid pace. When you're a sitting CIO, um, that's just a part of breakfast. You wake up every day and you know how that's changing and you're up to speed and you can go into the boardroom and bring that to it. You know, now being retired, I have to work at that. Um, so, so that's another big advantage for a sitting CIO. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Carol, the second question was, uh, you kind of talked about a little bit earlier, why should CEOs encourage their senior execs to take on external board uh, yeah. roles and what's in it for the company? Yeah. I, well, I, I think Wayne already touched on it, you know, that it may, makes you a better executive just seeing something else, but it just creates another set of relationships too, that, um, I love the concept of just phoning a friend instead of, you know, paying a consultant. So when you, when you're you're on a board, you've got that entire management team you can bounce things off of their relationships. I, I think it just brings value every day back to your your own role and um, to your relationships and your network. Yeah, yeah, so good, Mary Fran. Appreciate your questions, and she had another one. I'm not going to play it now, but Julie, uh, she was asking. Uh, she would love to talk about. Um, the need to broaden your network, right? Why that's so important to get that first board seat. And Carol, you talked earlier about just mm -hmm. connecting with people on a, you know, the, 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 boy, the lost boys of Sudan, right? You never know uh, what the connection will be, but why, Julie, should, uh, should executives now build that stronger network? Um, if I could just add one more bit to, to Mary Fran's question. And the one thing I would say is, um, you don't know how long it's going to take. You don't get to set the time frame from when, oh, now I'm ready to, to be on a board, right? So all the things that Wayne and Carol talked about are absolutely right. But the other thing is, is like the clock doesn't start ticking until you actually put yourself out there and start going for it. And I know some amazing, amazing people that it's taken a while to find that perfect match and that perfect board. So it's never soon too soon to start, in my opinion. Now to the networking question. Um, you know, I got to tell you, I think earlier in my career, I didn't do the networking that I should have. And it wasn't until I stepped into my first CIO role that I realized I need a new network because what I'm doing now is entirely different than the last several executive roles that I've had. And I was super intentional about finding any amazing CIOs that I could connect with and network with. Um, and was lucky enough to not just find an amazing community of CIOs, but also women CIOs. So it was just an amazing, it was super intentional. Then as part of that, I started to get the thought about like, hey, what is next, right? And would board service be something that I could do and capable of doing? And how would I go about doing that? So to Carol's point, it's about, you know, executive recruiters. Um, it's about the people within your network. Um, the one thing I would say is um, you also need to recognize that maybe the people that you've always relied on from a network perspective in terms of operational support, mentoring, and sponsorship may not be your same sponsors for board roles. Um, so I think it's it's you have to be strategic about the connections you want to make and actually 
almost manage it like a project as to what are the connections I want to get. The other is not okay to say, hey, I want to be on a board. It's this is the kind of board I'd like to be on. This is the kind of company I'd like to work with. And here's why I think I could bring value to that organization. Because I know a lot of people that are like, hey, I want to be on a board. It's like, that's not enough for me to help you, right? Like, let's really talk about what you think you can bring to the table. But more importantly, what types of companies excite you and are you passionate about? Because that's an important element as well. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting when I talk to the three of you, I'm always trying to recruit you back into out of, out of retirement, you know, we <laughs> get you back in the seat and you're all like, no way. This is way too much fun. It is I mean, fun. Enjoy this immensely. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so good to hear that. Okay, can I add something to what Julie just said? And that is um, we both, we've all said that the executive recruiting firm is really important, but one of the other really important things is other board members are the ones who recommend who the governance and nominating group should talk to. So it's their network. So that, that network that Julie's talking to is so important because the first place the board goes to their members and, hey, do you know anybody? What do you think? And this is what we're looking for. So I, I just say that those relationships and building that network is, is really vital. And, and a lot of times people will ask, oh, well, how about if I'm on a nonprofit? Does that become a stepping stone to a public company? And the answer is, well, maybe. It's good. Um, is it going to just be, I'm going to do this and that's going to happen? No. But I have seen people make a mistake in joining a nonprofit, thinking it's going to they join the nonprofit. They don't realize what that really means because it's a lot more nose in and fingers in when you're on a nonprofit. And you're on a nonprofit with a lot of philanthropic people who are looking to their left and looking to their right. And if suddenly you decide it's a little too much work, you know what? you just laid your cards out. So you just killed yourself because those powerful people are also the people who make recommendations and they just saw you take a job and then not do it. So if you're going to go the nonprofit route, I would just tell people you got to go all in or you can really make a mistake too. So just wanted to share that. No, hey Dan, I can, give a, I can give a real life illustration on this. Um, I hear a lot of people say, hey, the recruiters are really important to board roles, like 50% are filled by that. 50% is filled by your network. Just my own story, um, Corn Ferry recruited me for the Conway board. I'm on the Armstrong board because the former chairman of Conway went on to be on the Armstrong board and they were looking for a business um, tech savvy board member and, and that's how I got there. So it is, it is that, and your board connections um, you know, at the company you're at today, if you're a CIO and you've got board members and you want to be on a board, um, I think what Julie said was really wise was it's just not I want to be on a board, but think long and hard about what type of company and what you can bring to it and then go to those board members, you know, let your network know that you're interested in being on a board and, and what type of board you are. Otherwise, they're not going to know, but it's both those things are really important. Yeah. Yeah, I appreciate the intentionality there and, and being specific, right? Don't just go for a board role, go for the right board role for you. And I know so many C-level uh, friends right now who are interviewing for boards, aspiring for boards, because um, they, they know how much fun you're having. So, uh, but words of advice, wisdom, maybe even caution. How do you interview the board? Uh, for that position, how do you how do you interview them to make sure it's right for you? Mm. Any thoughts there? Any, any of you have any thoughts on that? As we wind it down here. Uh, I mean, I'll start, and I'm sure that Wayne and Carol have things to add. I mean, one is I think you do need to be pretty. Um, passionate about what it is that they do, right? Um, and and I will say that that it it's pretty easy you know, for boards to figure out if you're not really that interested in what it is that they do, but you want just a, a board seat. So, you know, for me, I mean, like with my first two boards, um, extremely mission-driven organizations, right? Like what they're doing and the impact it has on the world is, you know, I, I wish I could say the same about some of the companies I worked for, which were all amazing, right? And did great things. But if I look at the human element and, and the impact that they have, um, it's, it's, it's super inspiring, right? So I think for me, it was really being, 
that excited about what it was that the company did. And then as I was, you know, meeting with the 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 rest of the board is really kind of gauging were they as excited about it and saw what the opportunities and all those kind of things. But I think the other thing is, is there is just this, hey, do I feel like these are people that I can communicate worth, will I be heard, right? I just think there's some things that you just get a feel for during those conversations. And it almost goes back to what does that first board meeting look like um, if you don't feel like these are people that you're going to be able to voice your thoughts and ask hard questions and, and, and those types of things. Um, and also, you know, governance is critically important, but I, I wanted to, to know that there was more to why these people were involved with the organization, what they were going to bring other than just the governance perspective. Yeah. Is it different for women, Carol, when you're interviewing a board? Do you, do you look for di different things? Um, I've, uh, I've asked a couple, you need to ask some key questions when you're, when you're interviewing. Um, one was, as Julie suggested, you know, what, what is it the role you're looking for me to play? What is it that you're looking for me to, to bring? And I'm always looking for them to say something more than just technology and cyber. Because if they're going to paint me into that box in the interview process, that's, that's not, that's not where I want to be. So I think that's, that's an important um, question. And I think it's, it's also important. I've asked, you know, how, how are we going to work together for you to onboard me? Because I want to make an impact. You're going to pay me money and I don't like taking money that I'm not contributing, you know, for. And it's interesting because I didn't, I didn't learn to ask that question in my first board. And their way of onboarding me was to send me the last five years of board books. Here you go. Oh my gosh. It, it was horrible. It was just, and, and I didn't know what, good onboarding would look like. And I learned what it was look like. Now I ask about it because the sooner they onboard you for the domain and their business and their strategy and all those things, then the more you can contribute. So I, I always ask about onboarding and I ask specifically about the role they're looking for um, me to play in ensuring that we agree that that's something that I can and am willing to fill and they're willing to let me fill. Great point. Yeah, Wayne, wanna put a button? Put yeah, a I'll, I'll just, yeah, I'll just agree. And, and put an explanation port on what Julie and Carol said and just add um, another thing that I would that when I was interviewing the boards that I would look for is how they worked with one another could could did they have a collaborative relationship um, could did they I want to say did they like each other and like isn't necessarily that important is did they did they work well with each other did they listen to each other did they play off of each other did they seem to have a rapport um, you know, you hope it never happens, but you may be in a boardroom sometime on uh, with some really serious circumstances, and you want to be you want to feel real comfortable with the people that you're in there with, um, that you trust them, that you have similar values, um, uh, that you'll be heard and and you can hear and listen to them. So a lot that I would interview for was that particular board dynamic. How did it feel, and and was it something that I felt good about, and that that I could join in and and be a full fledged, uh, enthusiastic member of that board? Yeah, yeah. great teaching. Yeah. Connecting all that up, it's always good to research the board members, and chances are you know somebody who knows one of those board members, so you can get the real inside skinny of what the dynamic is in the boardroom if you can kind of make some of those connections. Because Wayne, I think you're right on. You, you spend a lot of time with these people. You got to be able to like them. And if it's tough, it's tough. Yeah. 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 Like you say, you get in those, uh, those difficult decisions, those difficult times. You want to be able to go into battle together, arm in arm, uh, make good decisions and uh, the heat of the moment. Yeah. Well taken. Um, well, bad news is we're going to put a big bow on the podcast. The good news is, uh, Read the CI Whisperers blog post coming out a week from now, where Julie and Carolyn Wayne are going to talk about uh, basically answering the question, if I knew then what I know now, how I would have led different or what I would do different as a CIO. And so we're going to have some fun with that conversation as we continue. But Carol, Julie, Wayne, thanks so much for your running around. You've got a lot going on, 12 boards, uh, families and and, and, and pets and grandchildren and all that, but uh, really appreciate you and coming on and sharing today. This was fun. It was fun. Thank you. 
Great to be with these. Uh, yeah. Great group. Yeah. Excellent. See you all next time.